And so we are blessed tonight to have somebody among our midst who is such that a great leader that Lord has raised up in Kenya and for Africa and for the world. Her name is Dr. Shiko Gital. I think I got it right. She's the CEO of Kuala. I didn't get that right because there's a that goes with that. I'm not going to attempt to do it the right way. She's, a, as I said, CEO of Kuala, which is a digital innovation company that catalyzes digital transformation capabilities for organizations across Africa. She has over 10 years of experience in research, design, implementation, and management of digital technologies. She has established expertise in both African and emerging markets, specialized in solving problems in agriculture, education, health, payments, retail, and renewable energies. My goodness, that's a wide array of expertise. She's responsible for the setup of Safaricom Alpha, a first-of-the-kind corporate innovation hub in Africa, where she worked as the head of products, innovation, and acted as the chief innovation officer. Previously, she worked for Safaricom, AFDB, and Google. Shiko sits on various boards and ICT companies and contributes to a number of steering committees and think tanks on Africa and technology. On top of it all, just as gravy, she holds a PhD and MSc in computer science from the University of Cape Town, South Africa. So it's my privilege and our privilege to welcome Dr. Shiko Gitao. Come on, I Africa in the house. All right. So much it's such a pleasure to be here i was telling somebody that this audience is a unique as eric said i speak in many conferences but not many christian conference i have like my church group that i speak to but i've never spoken to such a large amount of christians especially pastors yeah so i'm a bit nervous because i don't know which joke will land wrongly <laughs> um I mean, that was a great uh, introduction, Danny. But he forgot to mention one thing. I'm a pastor's daughter, so I was brought up in a Christian family, which is a good thing for this audience. But also, you, you have something on me. You know that we do preamble number one, uh, preamble number two, and ending number one, and ending number two. Um, so we'll start with a small activity. I'm trying to get my slides up. Um, I want you to go to this website, get out your phones. All right, I'm seeing everybody's going to their phones. Awesome. I'm so happy. Eric, your dad is doing better than you. <laughs> um, and then... There's a question on there. If, are you all there? If you're not there, tell me no. Okay, let's go back. Slow. Okay, slow. Are we there? Yes? Okay, I'm going to count down. 10, 8, 6, 4, 2, and 1. Okay. Oh, wow. Love it. Uh huh. Uh huh. No, no, no. Wait, wait, wait. Uh huh. And darkness. No, no, not yet. <laughs> Just a minute. All right. Oh, my goodness. The, the results are amazing. Okay. So we are going to give it another 10. Eight. Six, four, two, and one. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters, and God said, Let there be light. And there was light. 
How did that feel? <laughs> but have you ever thought, I mean, we read the Bible every time. All of us do a Bible in a year. I'm assuming I'm the crowd that do Bible in a year. So like on the 7th of January, you get to that point. And God said, let there be light. Have you ever thought what happened before that moment? Ever thought about it? In my mind, I think of it as a board meeting. It's literally a board meeting. And the spirit, because the spirit is what we start with in Genesis 1, he's the innovator. So he goes, hey guys, we need to have a quick meeting. I'm just from taking a walk. I have an idea. What if we made man in our own image Wait, what? and likeness? You mean like, like the angels? Yes, like the angels, but better. This one is really like us in both behavior and mannerism. All right, sounds interesting. I'm excited. You always have that board guy, right? The one who's always excited about new ideas, right? In your boards. Yes? Um, so but where are they going to live? Here with us? Actually, no. I saw this place that is just perfect. How does it look? Um, well, at the moment, it is dark, void, and without form. But before you say anything, it holds a lot of potential. Okay, okay, okay. Can we finish one thought at a time? This man you talk about, say we go ahead and create him. What are the risks involved? Um, about that. <laughs> Given that we are making him just like us, he'll have free will and all. He'll probably find out things like good and evil. He'll find the tree, the tree of life and go rogue on us. Are we sure we want to do this? The risks sound too much. Remember, we still have that Lucifer to deal with. There will always be a reference to failed projects. <laughs> um, but consider this. The returns are amazing. The worship will be amazing. All right. I hope you have thought of mitigating actions. Actually, I have a few. Let's start with death. Yes, we can cap out the amount of time they live. We can use things like a flood that wipes out everything, and we'll chalk this off as a lesson learned, and we can start all over again with better understanding. Oh, wait, wait, another one. Sulfur fire to burn out the stubborn ones. Is there anything else? Not sure we want to invest so much into something we're going to allow to just die. Well, um, there's one more thing. One of us has to go down and become man, take the wrath of death, and assure eternal life so they get to experience the best of both worlds. No. Mm. For the glory of seeing this man you speak of, I will go. Okay, my deck is coming up. Isaiah 40, okay. Uh, Isaiah, okay, my, one of my slides is not loading up. Isaiah 46, 10, declaring the end from the beginning, from ancient of times, the things that were not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand and I'll do that to their pleasure. Good evening. I wanted, <laughs> thank you. I wanted to bring that scene to us at the very beginning of this talk, because that is what we confront and we'll confront as we start the innovation journey. You will get the field project, you will get the no from the, if you didn't get that was the father God who said, no, we're not doing this. We're investing too much. And of course, Jesus said, I'll go. It is worth it. 
So even at the beginning of the earth, they knew we were going to fail. The Bible says from the beginning of the earth, they knew we were going to fail. And as you start your innovation journey, you are going to fail, but it's all worth it to start. I'll talk to you about redemptive innovation, restoring God's plan through innovation. For, for those of you who, has see, who have seen my face, apart from the brochure, and this time, you might have seen my face earlier in the year. I was talking to Michael. He was sitting somewhere here. Okay. Um, and I was telling him the way I read this Bible in a year pro program. I take it every year. And this year, particularly, I learned about God in a very specific way around innovation. And as we talk about this, I want to introduce to you, first of all, that innovation is God's idea. Yeah? The Holy Spirit is the key innovator. I mean, he, he came up with the idea of, let's do this, and they did this. So what is God's blueprint to innovation? We've already gone through Genesis 1, 1, 1, 2, and 1, 3. If you read all the way from Genesis 1, to 26, I mean 1, 1 to 26, the whole chapter, you understand what is God's idea to innovation. As you'll find out, I'm in the middle between Peter and Eric. Yes, I am a practitioner, but also I, I want to, to preach today. Not like Peter, he was like amazing. I, I had like serious imposter syndrome after I, I listened to him. <laughs> uh, I, I think I told Wendy, and Annette and my friends, I don't think I can make it. Even Eric, I think we had a discussion. We'll not be able to make this discussion. But so I'm, I'm, I'm praying that the Holy Spirit does this for me. So what is God's blueprint to innovation? Genesis 1, 2. I love that verse. That's why I thank you guys for making it. I like to let there be light. Yes. And there was. And for me, that anchors our our idea of innovation. So first of all is identify. Many of you who are today, today there was a session on innovation and digital um, design thinking. You learned about this. Innovation starts with a blank. The spirit of the Lord was on, void, without form. Yeah? And then preparedness. I'll take two seconds on this one. In Genesis 1, you will, you will see that God spent 50% of his time in preparation, 50%. He prepared it because he knew what was at the end. It was man. The game plan was man. He needed to prepare land for him. Light, sky, and earth. Planning and organization is key to innovation. You have to plan, you have to think about it. And I think this morning somebody said, we spend so much time designing bridges, not the people who are going to live in them, to walk in them. And that's what we should be looking at. Prepare, prepare, and God showed us this framework. The next one is build, but don't build everything at the same time. This is called prototyping or incremental or agility. We call it applying agility to create something new in your mind first with your words, but also with your hands. Yeah, you think it first, you, talk, you speak it out, and then you build it. And it's incremental. This is the same God the same God who said, let there be light and there was light, he'll have said, oh, let there be everything. And everything will have shown up, right? But he, he, he took time, started with vegetation, then seasons, day and night, sun and moon, birds, fish and land. And for the biologists in our midst, they will tell you, this was actually a practical way of doing it. Yes? If if we say we had land animals before vegetation, what would have happened? They would have died, yes? Sun and moon, without vegetation, vegetation without sun and moon, would have died. Seasons, they would have died. So building incrementally, but adding value from, to, to the previous version of it, yeah? So we can, I mean, in our world, we call it version one, version two, it's called versioning, right? So at version one was light, yes? At, at version, let's call it version 111, was vegetation. 
with seasons, with all these things. So you have to, in your mission field, be able to say, I'm going to start with a very small part and build on it incrementally. Commercialize, and I just felt like a cold thing passed through here, because this is not something you like hearing in the mission field. We have to be able to add value and sustainability, but also we have to be able to make money, even in the mission field, even where you are applying, because this is the only way to be sustainable. And it's a command, be fruitful, yes? Again, be fruitful, twice, in one chapter, yeah? And here, I'll, I'll go back to the, the story of the talent, yes? Who was, who, was most, uh, who, was, who was the faithful servant? The one who brought back the 10 talents, right? Why does that not apply to us in the mission field? Why don't we scale and multiply? That is a command from the Bible. So commercialization is part of the calling that we have as innovators from Genesis 1. And we have to scale. I remember seeing Eric's uh, talk today and saying he's two million people using brick, 170,000 instances of Wushahidi. That is impact. Our impact on the earth will be felt by the skill of our growth. And it's also a command, multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and get dominion over it. Stewardship. I think I read this verse too many times in a day or in a year. And so God created man in his own image and likeness. In the image of God, he created him, male and female. And he, behold, I give you every plant yielding seed in the face of the earth, every beast, every bird, and so it was. I always think about it, if you're looking at the version one, version two, version three of Earth, at this point, we are to version one, two, one, 1.26. We are going to version two. And so God is saying from version two, you're going to be co-creating with me. In fact, that verse, the last part, behold every abad, is in chapter two of Genesis, yeah? You need to be able to know that God, everything that God did previously, the, steward, the, the, the growing of an innovator, is already in you. And then I'll touch the point that I think Peter and, um, and Eric touched about, the fear of failure. You need to reflect and you will fail, 100% guarantee you will fail in one way or the other. But you need to be able to retrospect and course correct what we call pivot. So let us make money in our own image was version one. And then it is not good for man to be alone was version two. Did you see that God himself sat with himself and realized that we need to cost correct. There's something that is not right. And that's what you do in innovation. It's not going to be perfect the first round. It's going to always need some cost correction. And that time you have to build it in in the process of building to be able to cost correct. Yeah? Reflect, reflect, reflect. So that's my, if you're taking pictures, that's my summary slide. I'm going to give you 20 seconds. 10, 8, 6, 4, 2. Awesome. So I've, I've talked about that framework to innovation. So we have the perfect world and that not a perfect world. I was going to do another exercise, but we don't. I want to make sure that I get there. What are the most, when you think about it, what are the most pressing issues you're facing today? I've already shown you that God has a framework to innovation. What are the key things that are bothering our world today? Think about it. Climate change is the big one this year. Oh, and the pandemic, terrorism, poverty, Education, just to name a few. Yeah? So what, what is the role of the people in this room in handling this? We are going to missions, 
we're doing all these things. What more can we do? I'll, I'll give a statistic that I was, I, I was giving the table there. Think of this, the beginning of time to January of 2020. In your head, write one. Then, January of 2020 to June of 2020, write three. That is the difference in amount of content that was created because of a pandemic. Think of it, how much of that content was Christian content? How much was it? was consumed by people who did not know God. Because statistics showed that, we did, a, we did a study in Kenya and across Africa that showed that people moved towards God during the pandemic than any other time in history. It's a psychological thing that happens a lot. That when you're afraid, you turn to God. Which is a, makes sense, makes mission easy, right? But are we taking advantage in solving this once the pandemic and everybody is vaccinated? We are here, a thousand of us. Are we going to forget the lessons that we learned? How can we take advantage of what happened last year to step change changes in all these other areas that are affecting us as the world? So what is redemptive innovation? And how did I come up with that word? So I'm a pastor's kid, as I mentioned. So the word redemption, redemptive, I've heard that from, from birth, right? But this year it became quite clear. I took a class on re redemptive entrepreneurship. I wanted a business to, to practice redemption. And I learned a lot from that class about the idea of redemption. And there are many, many definitions. Most of you have taken Latin, I have not. And the idea of your identity being given to you back is very important. That was my understanding of redemption. Redemptive is that your identity being bought back. And that's what Jesus did to us. So this, there are many definitions, and I found this redeemer. I don't know the Latin speakers. I'm sorry, I just butchered that. And it means to get back, to buy back, to save. I found this very creative person who said re redemptive is to creatively restore through sacrifice. How can we build innovations that are redemptive? Because that's our call as the body of Christ and especially the people in this room. Our call is to lead in building these innovations. I've been in a number of classes today and workshops. I've said apart from your book, I've not seen anywhere else we've defined innovation during the conference. So I'm going to take a stab. I borrowed this from New Zealand because there are many definitions of innovation because I liked what they said. It's the creation, development, and implementation of new products processes with the aim of improving efficiency, effectiveness, or competitive advantage. What is your competitive advantage as a missionary, as a person who loves Christ, as a redemptive person? If you think about it, so after days of thinking on that definition, our redemptive innovation is the deliberate, because sacrifice is deliberate. You don't sacrifice when it's, you've not thought it through, right? So it's deliberate application of ideas, knowledge, and technology. And I added technology because of this group and because I, what, what I've seen technology do to the gospel undertaken in the development of new processes, products, and services in an effort to combat inequality and injustice. If we are to leave this room, innovate 2021 with energy, and go and say we are going to build products that are going to combat inequalities and injustice, 90% of the war has been won. Because all the stuff that I've shown you, the issues, are an outcome of inequalities and injustice. Technology is not working for me. Um, so what are the key characteristics of redemptive innovation? It has to be relevant. 
many of us, including myself. So it's not just you guys. We like gadgets. We build stuff. We brainstorm. We sat down and say, this is going to solve something. Is it contextually relevant to a problem? Are we solving something that is relevant? You have to always ask your question, that question. Is it feasible? Let's go back to the, in the beginning. What are the questions that God asked? Where are they going to live? Yeah? What are the key risks? Do you have mitigation factors? Yeah? Are you able to ask yourself those questions? And do you have answers to those questions? It's the feasibility part of it. Is it scalable? You'll see scalable a lot in this, this because this is something that is from the beginning. We have to be fruitful. Can you go beyond your current user base and location? And I'll come to examples of how this is going to work out. Is it sustainable? Can it survive and be profitable? And I want to emphasize on being profitable because again, it's a call to us to be profitable. Your innovation has to be able to beyond feeling good to being sustainable. And sustainability is not donor funded. It has to be human centered. You have to be people. I, I heard somebody say calling it people centered. I call it human centered. It has to be institutionalized. Don't build it for yourself and your own. Make sure that there's somebody else who's going to take it and run with it. Yeah? You've seen Eric is working with communities. I worked with government. Um, it has to be scalable. Yeah? Let it scale. It has to be inclusive. Make sure everybody, women, men, children, old people are included. You have to be able to democratize something. Yeah? Ensure that it's affordable and accessible to all. And this is not the only thing. This is like the Shiko definition of it. And I'd love for all of you to go out and find your own definition of it. And I want to leave you with this. This is the Great Commission. I've had it so many times this week than I've had it my whole entire life. All authority has been given in heaven and earth to make disciples, to baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, to teach, to obey, I have commanded you until the very end of the age. I just want us to say a prayer. Because sometimes innovation feels odious and far away from us. I was saying that my father, when I said, um, Dad, I found a job and said, where? Google. Oh, you've decided to work on the internet. <laughs> said, no, it's like a company. And you could still, still see the confusion in, her, in his head 10 years ago. Last year, he said, Dad, you know you, you, you're not allowed to go to church. You have to preach using the internet. He was like, how? Show me. We don't want yet another pandemic to be on that has going to do this for us. We have to take advantage of the times that we are in. So when we leave here, I'm hoping some of you are going to go to your grandchildren, ask them, how do I join TikTok? <laughs> I, I, can, I can just see some faces and like, I mean, you should have started with Instagram, TikTok. Yes, TikTok, because that's where many of your young people are. A million downloads every single day, yeah? 500,000 minutes uploaded every minute. Those are people that we cannot let go of. Yeah. So a great commission needs to be able to remember those five things. We are focusing on people. This, it's odd. Okay, it's refused to go back. It's audacious, it's human-centered, it's institutional, it's scalable, inclusive, and democratic. So I just want to say a prayer from an innovator's point of view to you missionaries. A blessing. In the same way, when I, when I was going to the marketplace, I went to the church and they prayed for me and anointed me for ministry. I want to be able to pray for you and anoint you for innovation. Um, love it. Uh, uh, dear Jesus, we come before you this evening. I want to say thank you. Because as much as you've called us to the Great Commission, you have also called us to innovate. Lord, 
I welcome you into this room, O oh Lord. Power your spirit to innovate. You're the original innovator. In every man, woman, even I've seen children here, Lord. Let them know deep inside that you have given the power to innovate. As they go out in the mission field after tomorrow afternoon, let this not just be another message that they had. Let it be something that they're going to practice. Let them find their own ways of doing this. Let them be redemptive in their work. In your holy and mighty name, Jesus, we pray. Amen.